thank you all for coming this evening. Um, tonight's the first night in a two-week evangelistic series. And uh, my name is Eddie Michaels, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I was, I just graduated actually last weekend from Southwestern, so that's really exciting news. Um, amen. And uh, yes, amen. It only took me 11 years, believe that. <laughs> no, 11 years plan. Uh, well, our seminar, our, our, our prophecy seminar this, uh, this next two weeks is called Hope Through Prophecy. And what our hope is, is that we will see from the Bible certain things that uh, allow you to put your trust and your faith in God and in, in God's Holy Word. At a time we are living, you know, we believe in the end times, which is the topic uh, for tomorrow is the end, uh, the end times, signs of the end times. So, you know, if you uh, would come back tomorrow, there would be some vital information that uh, everybody needs to hear. But, um, you know, the, it is our hope that in this prophecy seminar that you see uh, the signs of the times, that, that we are living in the last days of this earth's history, and that there, is a, that there is a hope for all of us in spite of all that, in spite of what is going on in the world around us. Um, is there a way we can get this projector going? Turn that on, maybe. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, well, um, so, with that being said, uh, to, every meeting is going to start at 7 p.m., okay? I'm going to do my best to get you out of here by 8 o'clock, okay? I'll try uh, my hardest. I have a lot of information to come with. I'll definitely try my hardest to get you out of here before 8 o'clock because I know everybody has a life. And uh, not everybody can uh, spend 24 hours a day up here at church like a pastor can, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, not too far. All right. well, if you guys are ready, uh, let's begin, if you don't mind, with a, oh, there's something else I want to say. Uh, prizes, right? That's right. Okay, we're going to have uh, prizes if you come back. Um, you know, at every, uh, I, I don't know, we haven't really figured out a number of yet, how many times we got to come for these prizes. But I assure you there will be drawings, and other nights we're going to have hell nuggets as well. And, uh, and if there's questions, if you have Bible questions, we put the box out there. So if you have Bible questions that you'd like to be addressed, um, go ahead and write them down. I think there's a box out in the lobby there, and they will be addressed at some point when we have time for that. But let's go ahead and get our, our meetings started here, and let's start with a word of prayer, if you don't mind. All right? Please write your heads with Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. I thank you for um, the opportunity to spend a Sabbath day in church with church family and, and good people. And Lord, I just ask now that as we open your word and, and seek to draw near to you, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us through your word, Lord. And I personally ask, Father, that you would use me um, to uh, give these people a message that you feel they need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And, 
you know, he has to bid for jobs. And I guarantee you that would be nice for him if he can know the future to know that at the end of that job if he's going to get paid or not. You know, but unfortunately, uh, he does not have that skill. But if you are thinking, you know, if you're thinking about getting married, wouldn't you like to know if your the person that you're thinking about marrying is going to meet your needs, or if you're going to spend the rest of your life in a miserable, agonizing marriage? I, you know, hopefully you would want to know if your you know spouse will make you happy in the future. We all want to know what will happen next. We all want to know the future. We would all make better plans if we could know what will happen. But unfortunately, it's not that easy to just know the future. In times past, people did strange things in order to know the future. Some examples of this, people tried to predict the future by the sunlight that would reflect on people's fingernails. Or there would be people that would cut open a sheep and, and take out its liver and try and study the shape of the liver to determine uh, what would happen in the future. Even today, this very day, you know, Excuse me, somewhere in the world there are people who are visiting uh, with astrologers, people who study the stars and the planets to try to know what the future will tell them. Others, you know, the others visit with psychics or they'll visit with tarot card readers, palm readers, even with witch doctors to try to find out what the future may have in store. But how well do these methods work for telling the future? You don't really need a fortune teller to know that these methods don't work well. Um, these methods are kind of like a duck hunter. You think of a duck hunter, and if a duck hunter were to just raise his rifle into the air and just start firing shots and hopefully hoping that he'll hit a duck that's flying over. This is not really a sensible way to go duck hunting. Just because we aren't very good at foretelling the future doesn't mean that the future can't be known to us. On the contrary, you know, the Bible tells us of a God who designs the future, a God who knows the beginning from the end, a God who is wise enough and powerful enough to forecast exactly what will happen in the future with unerring accuracy. And now this is a God that all of us can trust with our own lives and our own futures. Now here's what the Bible tells us about God. We see in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other God. I am God, and there is none like me. In Isaiah, oh, this is the same verse, excuse me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before, and new things I declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. I told you these things long ago, before it happened. I announce them to you in Isaiah 48, 5. Our God is a God who designs the future. And these verses are the promises that reveal, reveal the, that in these verses, the promises reveal the future to us. That's right. You and I can know the future. Not through studying the sheep, the shape of a sheep's liver, but from God's word, our Bible. Our Bible study tonight will do three things. The first thing we will demonstrate is that God indeed does know the future. Amen. Number two, God reveals the future of the world to us, and He, and, and he, will, he will show uh, what it means to you and I. Our study will also show that God reveals what He will do in the future. Okay, so I'm going to start with telling you a story. It, it, in this story, I'm going to tell you about begins um, in, in what we call today Iraq. You know, and it, it's a nation that we see in the news a lot today with uh, ISIS, what's going on with ISIS right now, and, and we see, uh, you know, even before that with the United States military being over there for so many years, uh, and Saddam and, uh, taking over where Saddam Hussein, you know, taking over for Saddam Hussein, I guess. Uh, but instead of talking about modern day Iraq, the news that Iraq is making today, we're gonna go back 2,600 years in time, when a powerful king rule the kingdom of Babylon. Now, Babylon obviously is the original name of the country of Iraq, and the king who ruled Babylon during this time was King Nebuchadnezzar. At the time, Babylon ruled the world, and our story recording comes from uh, the book of Daniel in the Bible. So let me ask you, have you ever had a dream that just perplexed your mind, that, that you were troubled with? You know, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream like this. It must, it must have been a nightmare for him. 
This dream so terrified him that he woke him up in the middle of the night and he couldn't even remember his dream. So I'm sure that's happened to every single one of us. I know it happened to me just last night. But in, in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, the king sensed that he had a dream and the dream's message was vitally important for him. So the king called all his wise men together and he commanded them to tell him the dream and then interpret the dream. He knew that if they couldn't tell him the dream, then they definitely wouldn't be able to interpret it. So he summoned all of his wise men, and that includes the magicians, the astrologers, the soothsayers, the kind of people that you know would read sheep slivers to tell the future. And of course, they couldn't tell the future. And we read in Daniel 2.11, they say that except those except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh will be able to tell that, that, that dream. So finally the king realized that none could do what he asked. They had no supernatural powers. They were not any wiser than he was. So he didn't really need them at all. So he gave the order to execute all the wise men of Babylon. And that's where uh, our, the, the author of the book of Daniel comes in. And in, in Babylon, there were four, four wise men, young Jewish men, that had been uh, taken from their homeland in Jerusalem when Babylon came in and conquered the city of Jerusalem. One of them was uh, a young man named Daniel. And when Nebuchadnezzar's guards came to execute him, Daniel did exactly what any of us would have done. Daniel went to the Lord in prayer. He asked the God for help. The Bible says that Daniel went back to his companions to pray. And we read in Daniel 2.18 that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret. They knew they were in a bad situation. They needed God as never before. So have you ever felt this way? Have you ever been in a situation that you felt was hopeless unless God helped you? I think all of us have been there. You know, personally, I can remember, um, I think it was maybe a year ago, when my grandmother was sick. She was admitted to the hospital to surgery to remove cancer. And, you know, my family does not typically go to church, but this was a time when we all came to the Lord in prayer to ask God to, uh, to heal it. And praise the Lord, He did that. But... We all have been in situations that we need to ask God for help. So that's exactly what Daniel did. That very night, God showed Daniel Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He told him what it meant, and Daniel praised God who came to his rescue. We can read Daniel praising the Lord. In Daniel 2.23, it says, Thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known... To us, the king's demand. When Daniel was brought before the king, okay, this is this is exactly what he said. If you want to open your Bibles, uh, we can we can read this in Daniel two twenty eight. You brought your Bible. I want to prove it to you from the Bible. I'll just make you read it off the screen. Amen. Daniel 2.28. I got the New King James Version reads like this. But there is a God, and this is what, now remember, this is what Daniel was saying to Nebuchadnezzar. It says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the later days. Your dream, the vision of your head, the vision of your head upon your bed were these. So he begins the, the secret of... Uh,
So you see, friends, God, God not only knows the future, okay, as we saw it, as we continue to see, but he reveals it to us. The creator of the universe, he revealed to Daniel exactly what he was going to do, and then he made it happen. A prophecy is not about the prophet. It's about God telling us what he's going to do. And isn't that exciting? God lets you and me know the future. This information is available in each of our Bibles. And, and Daniel did what no fortune teller could do. Uh, he told Nebuchadnezzar what his dream meant. And we can read this again in Daniel 2, verse 31 through 36. It's the same page. We'll keep reading. Daniel says, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, and the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like the wind carried became like the wind, carried them away, so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So in verse 36, we'll continue. It says, this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. He said, Daniel described this dream as exactly as the king had had, had, had dreamed it. A huge image raising up out of, with great splendor, glistening in the sunlight, awesome proportions. This image had a head made out of gold. It had a chest and arms of, of silver. It had belly and thighs of burnished bronze. And its legs were made of iron. And it continued down to his feet where iron was mixed with clay. Daniel told the king every detail of the dream, even how he watched the image and saw a stone that appeared to be cut out of a mountain without hands, without human hands touching it. The stone was hurled toward the image and it, it struck the image at the feet, completely pulverizing the image. And at that point, the entire image, including the head, the arms, the chest, uh, the, the, the belly and thighs and the legs, they were all put, turned into fine dust and, and went away with the wind. They blew away without a trace. Then it's, the stone appeared to grow until it filled the entire earth. Can't you just imagine the young man Daniel seeing this vision, the same dream that the king had and explaining to the king the dream and its interpretation? And let's listen to Daniel as, as, he, as he gives the interpretation of the dream in Daniel 2, 37 and 38. He says, you, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them, all a ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar in his dream, he told him a dream about great nations and great empires. And the, the first great empire would start with his own kingdom, Babylon. Daniel continued with the rest of the interpretation. He says in verse 39, but, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. As history has shown, great nations and empires don't last forever. There were two kingdoms that came after Babylon. One symbolized by silver, the other symbolized by bronze in the statue. But the interpretation doesn't end there because the dream doesn't end there. Daniel continues in verse 40 through 43. He says, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. 
As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the sea of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now Daniel next described the fourth kingdom destroyed by the legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. And then Daniel goes even further into the future. So remember in the dream where there was a giant rock that smashes the statue and fills the whole earth. What could this possibly mean? Daniel explains to us in verses 44 and 45, he says, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Daniel takes Nebuchadnezzar to the end of the world. He takes him into future kings to come. And look how certain Daniel is regarding this interpretation. He said, this is what will be in the future. And its meaning is sure. How could Daniel be so certain? Because he trusted in God. In the God who revealed the dream to him. The same God who showed Daniel what he would do in the future. Daniel learned to trust the Creator God, the God of the Bible. How important is it then that you and I also learn to trust Him? What was this dream and its interpretation about? It was about a wonderful God revealing the future of the world right down to the end of time. It tells of God revealing how the world would end, which will happen very soon. So what is exciting for you and I about this is that thousands of years of after Daniel interpreted the dream, as we look back over human history, we see how accurate the interpretation was. God did exactly what he said he would do. And we saw the head of gold symbolized by the great Babylonian Empire. It ruled the ancient world. And one of history's greatest uh, ancient historians, Herodotus, he marveled at the gold used in the temples of Babylon. According to another modern Bible scholar, uh, Dukan, it comes from uh, the Khan Book of S Secrets of Daniel, page 29. It says, Walls and statues and other objects of gold testify to Babylon's splendor and glory. Babylon ruled the world from 605 to 539 BC. Just as God told Daniel that he would do, he raised up another empire after that. The second empire that was symbolized by the silver of the chest of silver, the arms of silver, was Medo-Persia. The Medo-Persian Empire was never as great as the Babylonian Empire, but it was a powerful empire nonetheless. Both the Bible and secular history describe the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire upon the ashes or the ruins of Babylon. History, uh, historian, uh, okay, this comes from ancient Israel, Herschel Shanks, page 165, it says, when Cyrus the Great, the ruler of Persia, conquered Babylon in 539 BC, the Persians succeeded the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, as the major imperial power in the Near East. Now, now then we come to the, the third kingdom that, that Daniel said would rule over the, all the earth. This is an amazing prediction about the rise of the great Greek Empire. And it, it came to power under one of the most famous and influential conquerors in all of history, Alexander the Great. Alexander, Alexander the Great expanded his empire more quickly than anyone had ever done before. He conquered so swiftly, according to legend, that, when, that he wept when he found out that there was no more world to conquer. And at the age of 33, Alexander the, Eighth, uh, Alexander, Alexander the Great died. So by 168 Greece, BC, the Greek Empire, the third empire mentioned, ended exactly as God told Daniel it would. Through, through Daniel, God told Nebuchadnezzar the fourth world empire would appear, symbolized by iron legs. That great empire came to power just as Daniel predicted, and that was the Roman Empire. And it reigned from 168 BC to 476 AD. Within a short time after the Grecian Empire ended, 
pagan Rome became the undisputed ruler of the ancient world. It ruled for 600 years. And this empire ruled longer than any than all the previous empires and covered the lands from Europe to Asia to Africa. Daniel described the kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar with these words. He says in verse 40, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and, and crush all the others. The famous historian Gibbon, uh, in his masterwork, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, used the same imagery Daniel used to describe the Roman conquest when he wrote, and the images of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. What an accurate depiction of the ancient Roman Empire that is, an, an iron monarchy. Now notice something amazing, okay? There was a separate medal for Babylon, right? That, that, that medal was gold, symbolized the head of the statue. That was a separate medal. Then after that came a separate kingdom, Greece. Greece had its own medal, and it was symbolized by the silver and the chest and the arms. Then there was a third kingdom, a separate kingdom, that had its own separate medal, and that was bronze. And the Roman Empire had its own medal, too. It had iron because it was also a separate empire. So as you look at the statue, notice how no new metal rises. Okay, no new metal rises from after the Roman Empire. No new earthly kingdom comes. The metal begins in the legs, and that's the last metal. Until, uh, and that, go, that iron goes all the way down into the toes. When it's in the toes, it mixes up with clay, right? So what does that mean? It means exactly what Daniel said it meant. The fourth kingdom would be divided. It would be broken up into various places, various nations, some powerful, some weak. And I want you to stop for a second and think just how amazing that part of the prophecy is because God predicted or God told Daniel that there would be one kingdom that would succeed another. One kingdom would conquer another. But at the fourth kingdom, he doesn't say that the fourth kingdom would be conquered. He says that the fourth kingdom would be divided. And that is incredible to think about. And so we read in Daniel 2, 41 and 42, it says, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And again, this is an amazing prediction. God described exactly what would happen to the Roman Empire, which wasn't swept away by another kingdom as those that preceded it. Instead, in the 5th century AD, barbarian tribes of Europe came in and broke up the Roman Empire into various nations. And eventually, those various nations are what we know today as modern Europe. Notice the Bible predicted the Roman Empire would be divided into parts that are both strong and fragile. And this is also another accurate description of history. At times, nations such as France, England, or Spain were strong, while the others were weak. In other words, just as the prophet said centuries earlier, it would, it would be partly strong and partly weak, and that's what it was. But notice what else it said about the divided fourth kingdom. It says in Daniel 2.43, as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron is not mixed with clay. In an endeavor to unite the nations of Europe, ruling monarchies have engaged in a great deal of intermarriage. And yet despite all the intermarriage, God, God told Daniel, they will not adhere to one another, just as iron is not mixed with clay. And again, an amazing uh, uh, prediction in European history, uh, which has a stream of failed attempts at unity. If you look at uh, Adolf Hitler, you know, Adolf Hitler was attempting to reunite uh, all the nations of Europe. You look at Napoleon Bonaparte further back. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, he also was trying to unite all the nations of Europe under one flag. Kaiser Wilhelm, he was trying to do the same. But all, all their attempts failed. All their attempts failed to unite Europe. And if you look at a map of modern-day Europe, yes, 
this, you will see various economic, cultural, you know, military um, similarities or, or alliances. But these are all still separate nations. They have separate political systems. They have separate cultures, separate languages. They have separate agendas. But now let's remember how the dream ends. It ended with what? It ended with a stone, a stone cut out without hands, crushing all other kingdoms until nothing was left. So what does this mean? Again, let the word of God tell us. Okay, let's let the word of God tell us. It says in Daniel 2.44, And in, these day, in, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not, shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. In other, in other words, amen, that's right. In other words, during the time of these nations of modern Europe, okay, God promised that, he, that the God of heaven will remove all earthly kingdoms and establish his own eternal kingdom. A kingdom where there is no more pain, there is no more war, there is no more suffering, there is no more death. And this is just what will happen when Jesus Christ returns. God will do just as he promised he would do. Amen. Think about this, okay? Babylon came and went, just as God predicted. Medo-Persia came and went, just as God predicted. Greece came, went, just as God predicted. And Rome came, and it, didn't, it wasn't conquered as the Bible predicted. It was divided. And, and into different nations. And this is just what God predicted. So the part of this, the only part of this prophecy in Daniel 2 that is yet to be fulfilled is the part where God comes back and establishes his eternal kingdom. So where are we today in history? We look back to see the Bible accurately predicted all the world kingdoms that were to come. If the Bible is right about all those, why not trust in this last part of the prophecy? The only one not yet fulfilled. God not only knows the future, He has revealed it to us. Um, he wants us to see uh, the final end. Everything isn't just death and destruction. In a world that seems like things are hopeless, there is hope because this is not the way that, that everything ends. Amen. But instead, God, God will set up an eternal kingdom where the horrible things of this world are gone forever. The kingdom, that kingdom, is just as sure to come and, and, and come to pass as, as all the past kingdoms have already come. And because God is not just predicting the future, He is bringing it to pass just as He said He would. God is just telling us what He's going to do, right? Amen. So when you say tomorrow, when, when you say to yourself, tomorrow I'm not going to work, I'm going to stay home and rest, does this mean that you are a prophet? No, absolutely not. You're just telling others that, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to work today, right? Well, when God says the kingdom of Babylon will not last forever, another kingdom will take its place, he's simply telling us what he will do. He places kings and thrones and, and removes them as he chooses. But when God confides to Daniel his intentions for the future, uh, and, and when the predictions come true, it demonstrates that God's word can be trusted. Amen. Right? So, and, and friends, let me ask you this important question. We learned, we've, learned, we've been learning something so far tonight about God and about his power, about his might and his care. And how have we learned this? That's right. We've learned this from his word, the scripture. In Daniel 2, we have powerful evidence that God speaks to us through and not man's. And this is just the beginning. You know, all throughout this series, I guess, uh, throughout this series, we're going to be uh, every night, uh, except on Wednesday night. Don't come on Wednesday night, right? If you come, nobody else will be here. That happened to be the first prophecy sent by our own to the home of our But we will come across, uh, we'll, uh, as the nights progress, we'll go on and, and we'll look at the evidence from God's word and see that God's word is trustworthy. It is the only thing in this world that we have a solid, it's a solid foundation for a world that is 
pulling us in every direction, for every window doctrine, trying to get us to believe different things. But God's word is the one true thing that you can trust. And I believe that that's what we have seen through this prophecy in Daniel 2. Because, you know, God showed us exactly what he was going to do. He showed us that there were four kingdoms, right? Four kingdoms. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And then after that, no more kingdoms, but divided Rome. And that's what we know as modern Europe. Okay, if God, God predicted that, uh, you know, if God can predict that, that prophecy happened, Babylon came to power and destroyed for something like, I believe, 539 B.C. So it, Daniel, the prophecy of Daniel happened sometime after that, right? While Babylon was still in power. And God predicted, God showed Daniel the future for over 2,000 years later. Showed him all the way up to this point, right? So there is something that we can trust in today's world. We can trust God's word. Amen. God wants his word to become the ultimate authority in our lives. And this is the big, this now is the big question. How long are we to listen to what God's Word has to say? And you may have heard some people say that the Bible was a myth, or you know, it's it's been it's been taken from a primitive culture, and, and it's not trustworthy. But God's Word is is trustworthy, and, and it should be the ultimate authority in our lives. And that's what God wants for it. That's why God gave us this Bible. That's why God gave us this book, is so that we have a, a, a rule of thumb, something to live by. Words to trust in, in, in times of uh, desperation or, you know, things when we aren't sure about what, what will happen in the future because the world around us is crashing in. And we need something to, to, to tell us this is how we need to live in these last times. So God has shown us his word is relevant to our times because he predicts the time that we are living in. He showed us that uh, we are living in a time of divided Rome where the modern European nations so, you know, we, we can rest assured in the fact that God is in control. Amen. God has spoken uh, to us through his word, and he has shown us he is indeed in control. We can trust him completely. So, as we have studied this prophecy, we have clearly seen how God can and does predict the future, because he knows the future. God, God outlined the future of the world for over 2,600 years reaching all the way down to our day. He not only predicts the future, but he makes it happen. The only part of this prophecy that is not yet come to pass is the establishment of his kingdom, which represents the rock cut out without hands. We will see in future meetings that the fulfillment of that part uh, of the prophecy is soon to come. And you can see why we can trust him. He has managed the world's history for all these years. He has brought to pass history just as he prophesied. So friends, if God is in control of history and will guide us, and will guide history to, to, a, to its end, and in the establishment of his kingdom, you and I can trust him with our lives. Amen. So with that being said, that is all the lecture that ran kind of short. I guess I'm getting you guys out of here early. <laughs> So that's good. I guess maybe that'll make you want to come back. Maybe, yeah. yeah. So with all that being said, friends, uh, if you would, if, if you today, just, you know, whether you're a new Christian or you're a faithful believer of 60, 80 years, if you today want to trust God with your future and say to him, save me a place in your kingdom that will soon be set up on the earth, would you please stand with me as we pray? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, again, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day, Lord, for the opportunity uh, to come together and, and see from your word that you are a God that, that knows the future, Lord. You set up kings and you bring them down, Lord. And we thank you so much for showing that to us from your Bible, Lord, from the Bible, that we now know that we have a God in whom we can trust, um, and we can trust with our lives, from the smallest things in life uh, to the greatest issues that we will come across, Lord. And tonight, Lord, this is just the first night in the series, and I pray that um, you would be here with us each night, Lord, I pray.
pray that you would bring the people here that need to hear these messages, Lord, and, and use me as your servant to speak the words that you want them to hear, Lord, that I would not be heard, but that your Holy Spirit would work through me, Lord. Mm -hmm. And now as we go uh, our own ways, Lord, as we leave uh, the chapel this evening, Father, I pray for traveling mercies for everyone, Lord. I pray that as we close out the Sabbath, we will just get one last chance to embrace you and, and to uh, see your love on the Sabbath, Lord. And I pray that you bless them in the rest of this week to come, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, you are, you are dismissed, and I want to invite you to come tomorrow night, 7 o'clock.